Hey guys, today I'm going to talk about long-term potentiation and long-term depression. And I'm going to talk about them in the context of learning and memory, especially as it relates to the hippocampus, which is this part of the brain here, where long-term potentiation, or LTP, has been best studied. So first we're going to do a quick review of the basic way in which an actual potential is transmitted down a presynaptic neuron to a dendritic spine and uh, causes an action potential. First, we have the depolarization of the presynaptic neuron, and that's going to be the inflow, that's going to be caused by the inflow of sodium ions represented uh, by pink here, these pink dots which are higher in the extracellular solution than inside the cell. They're going to flow in and cause an impulse that travels down. I'm going to just represent the impulse in yellow here. That impulse or depolarization of the presynaptic neuron is going to lead to the opening of new channels. These are going to be our calcium voltage gated channels, and these channels are going to let in calcium once the signal arrives, so there's high calcium outside. The signal arrives in the form of a depolarization which opens these uh, calcium channels as depicted in silver. And that's going to allow for calcium to flow in and in the presynaptic neuron there's going to be uh, vesicles filled with glutamate because we're sp focusing on glutamate um, syn synapses in this particular uh, discussion. And so the glutamate is going to be released from the presynaptic neuron into the synapse, and they're going to bind with receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. In particular, we have AMPA, which I'm going to depict in red, and we have NMDA receptors. So it's going to bind to these receptors and cause a depolarization of the postsynaptic of this den dendritic spine, the postsynaptic dendritic spine. To get a close look at this, we're going to zoom in and see what happens. Okay, so there are a lot of players on the field, so let's make sure we get them all well labeled. These little pink dots are going to be our sodium ions. The larger green dots are going to represent calcium ions, we've got some glutamate containing vesicles here, this is our calcium gated channel, calcium voltage gated channel, this is going to be our AMPA glutamate channel, AMPA. and this is going to be our NMDA channel. So the AMPA and NMDA channels, AMPA and NMDA channels are two glutaminergic ch ion channels that are named for the other agonists other than gl glutamate that cause ions to flow through um, the op and open the channels. Uh, in the case of NMDA, it's N-methyl D-aspartic acid, so that's where the name NMDA com comes from. And in the case of AMPA, it's a mouthful. It's alpha amino 3 hydroxy 5 methyl 4 isoxylpropionic acid. So, of course, no one really, everybody just calls it AMPA and NMDA. And so these channels, when, when glutamate is released, it will bind to these receptors. And in the case of the AMPA receptor, that will allow for the sodium ions in the extracellular space. So these are going to be our sodium ions. The sodium ions are going to pass through and depolarize the postsynaptic membrane. So the postsynaptic membrane is going to be at a, uh, at a less negative voltage. So this is going to be as a result of the prevalence of the sodium ions. On the other hand, the NMDA channel 
even though it has bound, even though it has bound a glutamate ion, it can't open because it's blocked by an M a magnesium ion. So here we have the Mg2 plus ion representing the magnesium ion blocking this channel from fully opening. Instead, in order for the NMDA channel to properly open, there has to be enough positive charge, enough of the positive charge from the sodium ions that are let in by the AMPA channel to allow for a strong positive charge to develop around the NMDA channel in the uh, postsynaptic membrane and force the magnesium ion out. So it's just this, a simple case of like charge is repelling and the magnesium ion is going to be ejected because of the prevalence of sodium ions in the postsynaptic neuron membrane. What's special about the NMDA recept uh, ion channel is that as soon as it's open, in addition to the sodium ions, that's a little bit too big, I'm going to represent the sodium ions as a little bit smaller, so sodium ions flowing through the NMDA channel, so it's going to be further depolarized, the, the um, postsynaptic neuron dendrite is going to be further depolarized um, as a result of the influx of sodium ions. So in addition to sodium ions, there's also going to be some calcium ions that will flow through this channel. So the NMDA channel would, is, uh, allows both sodium and calcium ions to flow in. Calcium represented by green here. And the calcium, as in many other uh, cells, will cause, um, because it's so reactive, will cause a, a cascade of events that will lead to a permanent or a long-term change in the postsynaptic uh, uh, dendrite. So just to make it a little bit more easily visible, we have a little bit of the other stuff cleared away, but we have the calcium ions entering through the now open NMDA channel, and what happens now is they will go and ahead and bind to this kinase, which is depicted in blue here. So we have calcium binding to the kinase, and that leads to the kinase phosphorylating, phosphorylating, adding a phosphate group to the AMPA channels. This is going to be our AMPA channel here, and that actually makes the AMPA channels much more efficient at letting in sodium channels. So when they're open, they'll be a little bit wider open and more more sodium will flow in. Also, the, uh, the kinases will also phosphorylate other ion channels that are um, in the cytosol. So other AMPA channels, this will be an AMPA channel here, and once that's phosphorylated, the AMPA channel is much more likely to go up to the surface where it will be also able to allow more sodium ions in, further depolarizing the membrane. On the other hand, because phos there are also phosphatases present, this is going to be our phosphatase presence in the cytosol of these dendrites, these dendritic spines, um, the phosphatases have a slightly higher affinity for calcium than the kinases and they are actually more likely to bind calcium than the kinases. So at lower concentrations of the calcium, they will actually cause the opposite effect of the kinases and they will uh, lead to the removal of phosphatases, uh, of phosphate groups from the AMPA channels and that will actually decrease the inflow of sodium leading to depression. This is the mechanism for long-term depression. Therefore, if you have uh, many small um, many small stimulus, stimuli 
coming down. So small stimuli leading to a, just a very small release of glutamate and a small influx of calcium. It will actually activate the phosphatases rather than the kinases. But if there's enough calcium, the ca the kinases will have enough to take over, and because they are more active, they'll overpower the phosphatases, leading to long-term long-term potentiation. The end result is that whereas before it would take a very large signal and a very large release of glutamate to activate a lot of receptors to cause a full depolarization to travel down the, the postsynaptic neuron. Now, only a small signal is needed and a very small release of glutamate is needed to activate a fully sized, a full action potential in the postsynaptic uh, neuron. So what does this all have to do with learning and memory? Well, if you're familiar with the Pavlovian dog experiment, where a, f a dog is fed and each time it's fed, a bell is rung, eventually the dog associates food with the sound of the bell, and even with just the bell ringing, the dog will salivate, even though before it would only salivate when food was um, offered to it. So, in a similar fashion, we have we can have long-term potentiation of the food. Let's, let's, we can simplify this situation. So, this is going to represent our food, um, our neuron for, um, that's associated with good food, with tasty food. This is going to be a neuron associated with the sound of a bell, and this is going to be a neuron that causes salivation. So, this is an oversimplification, just to get the idea of long-term potentiation and associative memory. Uh, when the dog is offered food, it will receive a signal that causes it to salivate. Let's make it a little bit bigger so it's clear. So it will receive food and that will lead it to sal salivate. If that happens enough, there will be uh, long-term potentiation in the dendritic spine associated with the food. So there will be calcium flowing in and the entire cascade that leads to increased flow of sodium ions and depolarization. And when this happens, sometimes the nearby dendritic spines can be affected by the depolarization. So if the original, if this dendritic, if this synapse is um, it undergoes long-term potentiation, and a bell is rung at the same time, even though the bell is not normally associated with food, because there is long-term potentiation in the food synapse, there will be a little bit of leakage. And even though a small, a small uh, signal may pass down the bell um, neuron, it will lead to the firing of an action potential because it's been partially depolarized by the food synapse. When the food is removed, when so that there's only a bell being rung, only a bell is being rung, then because it's been potentiated, it will still fire and the, the dog will salivate just from hearing the bell. Okay, well I hope you learned a little bit about long-term potentiation and long-term depression in the context of learning and memory. Thank you for watching.